excited that you're here with us to kick off 2014. There's no better place to be, so I'm really excited to see all of you guys. And we have a very special guest in the house kicking off the new year with us. He's sitting right down here in the front row, Pastor Tim Chambers from Shore Fellowship in New Jersey. And I'd like to invite him up, so let's go ahead and welcome him to the stage. What's up, Barefoot Church? <laughs> it's good to be in the house and good to be back with you guys. You can go ahead and have a seat. You know, I don't, I don't know what uh, condition that you came here today in and, and what's happened over the last year in your life, but I believe that God sent me here today to tell you that he's going to do something new in your life in 2014. Can I get an amen on that? And maybe you're here a little discouraged, and maybe you're here a little bit tired from the holidays, and maybe you're here uh, a little bit without hope, and your hope meter's down on low. I'm just telling you, God wants to do something new, and I believe that he'll do that in you today. He'll begin that today, and he'll carry it out through this year. And I believe that God wants to blow you away with what he wants to use you to do for his kingdom. And I hope you'll engage and believe in that today. You know, I believe that God wants to do something new, and you might say, why? And I would say this, because you are a chosen generation. You're a chosen generation. You know, in, in 1 Peter, and let me tell you, by the way, Peter uh, wrote a book that's in the New Testament, actually wrote more than one, but Peter was a dude that messed up, and he followed Jesus. I mean, he was with Jesus, and, and sometimes he didn't know when to shut his mouth. Anybody in the house sometimes not know when to shut your mouth? I'm not going to ask if you're sitting next to somebody who doesn't know when to shut their mouth. I don't want to get anybody in trouble here. But Peter sometimes didn't know when to shut his mouth. Sometimes he opened his mouth and incredible things came out. But sometimes when he opened his mouth, he was denying Jesus Christ. But I am so thankful that his story didn't stop there. I'm so thankful that God did something new in his life. And we can talk about him today as somebody who was a defender of the faith, as somebody who really shined in his last hours. And so I want to talk to you about what it says in 1 Peter because, you know, if, if, if here's a guy that's just like us, he messed up but he ended up great, I think we should pay attention to what he's saying. Can I get an Amen. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 9, it says, but you are a chosen generation. It says, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You know, there's a lot of great people in the Bible. I, I think of Moses. Moses, who was a great leader, but how many of you know he didn't start out by being a great leader? God turned him into a great leader. And I love reading the story of Moses. And then you have David, who was a, a great king. But you know, David wasn't always a great king. David made some mistakes that he had to overcome and ask God to forgive him in his life. I mean, you, you think of, of people like Samson. Samson was the strongest man on the planet, but even the strongest man on the planet had a weakness that he had to overcome. But God still used him in his final days. And I think of, of Solomon, who was the wisest man in the world to ever live, but his wisdom at times got him in trouble and caused pride. But God still used him, and God chose those men for that generation. But you need to know this. This is 2014. And God didn't choose Moses for 2014. God didn't choose Samson for 2014. God didn't choose David for 2014. God didn't choose Solomon for 2014. He chose you for 2014. This is your time. This is your generation. The enemy may have convinced you that your story's over. The enemy may have knocked you down, but I want you to know that's the best place you can be because that's where God does his greatest work, and God's going to do something new in you if you'll just embrace that today. Amen? Look at your neighbor and say, God wants to do something new in you. You know, he wants to, he wants to build a, a generation of new in your life, a, a generation of new praise, a generation of new power, a generation of new grace, a generation of new faith, a generation of new believers, a generation of new opportunities, a generation of new hope. God knows that we need some hope. A generation of new honor, a generation of new unity, a generation of new priorities, a generation of new prayer, a generation of new commitment, 
and more importantly, a generation of new families. I, I'm praying at Barefoot Church that some families get renewed and restored in 2014. I believe God wants to do something new and fresh at Barefoot Church. In Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 19, God says this, For I am about to do something new. I'm about to do something new. See, I've already begun. See, some of you don't realize this, that God's already at work in your life. And you can't see it. You can't recognize it. You don't even know it's happening. You, you see all the negative and all the, the bad happening. You think somehow that can't be in God's plan. But I'm going to tell you what, that's part of God's plan. He allowed his children to go through the wilderness for 40 years. And Deuteronomy chapter 8 says to test them, to try them, to see what was in their heart, to see what they're made of. So God is at work in your life whether you realize it or not. And he says, I'm about to do something new. See, I've already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in a dry wasteland. Maybe you come here today and your life feels like a dry wasteland. Well, you better get ready because God's getting ready to shine. You better get ready because God's being, getting ready to allow that dry wasteland to become something fresh. I want to ask you today, how many of you want to see God do something new in your life? Amen. Amen. Now, let me ask you a second question. How many of you believe, how many of you believe that God can do something new? You know, it says in Hebrews 6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. We can talk all day long about how we want to have a new year, and we can make all the resolutions in the world. But at the end of the day, if we don't believe that God can change things, if we don't believe that God could bring something fresh and something new, it doesn't make a bit of difference. And so I, I'm trusting, I'm trusting that God is going to challenge your faith today, that he's going to renew your faith today, that even when things out in front of you don't look like it's possible, that you will trust God for something new. Amen? Amen. We're believing for something new. You know, if you, if you want some things to change in your life, then you need to learn to embrace change as a core value in life. I, I want to share with you like four things about, about change that are unchangeable. Things about change that are unchangeable. Number one, if you're taking notes, things are going to change. Amen? Amen. How many of you have learned that in life? Things are going to change. You, you might fight it. You might resist it. You might try to act like it's not happening. You, you might always try to get away from the situation where it's taking place because you don't like change, but you need to know something. Change is always going to happen. It's just a matter of fact. Things are going to change. Number two, things need to change in order for things to get better. How many of you know things need to change in all of our lives? How many of you know there's things that nobody knows about? that are the reasons deep down within why we're not changing. There are things we're not talking to others about. There are things that we're not sharing with others. There are things that we are hiding. And, and, we, and you know, people around wonder, why does their life never change? Because they're not changing what's going on in the inside. And so things need to change if we want things to get better. How, how many can remember dial-up internet? My God, is, is it just me or is that noise embedded in anybody else's head? It's like you waited there forever. How many are thankful for that change? <laughs> you know, it's always funny when, when change happens to hear people complain about it in the moment. And I still remember people complain about, you know, Wi-Fi. But I'm so thankful that when you embrace change, it helps make things better. A third thing about change is, is this, is things are going to change for better or worse. Things are going to change for better or worse. And you can't make change work for you, or, or you can make change work for you and not against you by remaining positive. And number four, things are going to change with or without you. They're going to change with or without you. Change is vital. We need to learn to be focused on change. And you know, I've learned something over the years. If you keep doing the same things over and over, you're going to get what? The same results. That is the definition of insanity. You think somehow you're going to get something different when you keep doing the same things. And I, 
maybe you figured this out by the few times I've been here. I'm a little bit ADD. We got any ADD people in the house? So you, you feel my pain. You know what I'm talking about. Like ADD people, we can, we can like jump from one thing to the next. We love change. As a matter of fact, we can't stand things that don't change. We probably change things too often and frustrate a lot of people in our life. And what I've learned sometimes, if I'm not careful, I will jump from one thing to the next. I just, for change's sake. I started thinking about what, what really is change, and, and when God wants to do something in my life, what does that look like? And what I begin to realize is change isn't necessarily just totally walking away from what's already there. Maybe change is adding to what God is already doing. Maybe change is putting an addition on the house. Amen? You know, sometimes we think we need a new house. Why not just build an addition on that house? And sometimes, you know, we look at our life and we think we got to totally chuck everything. Well, I believe maybe God's building some foundation that's already there. You just need to add to it and build an addition. So look at your neighbor and say, build an addition. Let me ask you a question today. Where do you need to change? Where do you need to be renewed? And when I say that, I'm not talking about externally. I'm talking about in your heart. You know, some, you might look at your finances, because if we're not careful when we talk about change, we look at external things. But you look at your finances, and maybe your finances are messed up, and, and you start thinking, well, if I do this, and I do that, and I do that, and I take care, it's all external things. When at the end of the day, the reason you're so screwed up financially is because you don't have principles that are based in the heart. You make choices that are bad choices because you don't have a foundation of what the Word of God teaches when it comes how to handle our money. You some of you have a porn addiction, not because every picture on the planet is tempting you, because you lack integrity in your heart. You lack the ability from your heart to bounce your eyes to something else and keep yourself from that temptation. See, if we're not careful, what happens is we try to change things on the outside without ever working on what's really going on in our heart. So a change, a real true change has to take place within you. Also be careful when we talk about change, not to immediately think about all the people and circumstances in your life that need to change. You may know what I'm talking about. I get up here, I say, things need to change. You start thinking, yeah, my husband. I'll tell you what I could change about him. Well, I wish my wife would. Or if my circumstance wasn't what it was, then you know what? Forget about that. You know what God's interested in? He's interested in you changing from the core, from the inside out. I believe if you change, it'll change the circumstances in your life. Real change comes from within. You can't be a new creation if you drag around the same old nasty self. Amen? So we need to leave 2013 behind and step into a fresh 2014. You know, my desire for Barefoot Church is that God gives you a fresh start, not just for you, but also for the ones that you love. And I believe that's what a new year offers. You know, when Jesus showed up on the scene, he, he showed up and he started busting down some of the old traditions and started establishing a new thing. And that's what he wants to do in your life. I, I want to share with you today uh, the 10 most important words that Jesus ever spoke. The 10 most important words that Jesus ever spoke. And it's found in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 19. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 19 says this. Check it out. He says, follow me. Say that with me. Follow me and I will make you, say that, and I will make you fishers of people. You know, I, I've been in church all my life and I've heard that verse all my life and I think that's a great verse and that tells me what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. And, but the thing is, I, I'd always just looked at that verse as a statement but in this last year, as I was reading through the chapter there in chapter 4, and I came across that verse, God rocked my world because I saw it for, for the first time in, life, in my life as not just a statement, but a process, a journey that Jesus wants to take me on, a, a relational thing. Because if you want to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ, how many know it doesn't happen overnight? 
How many know it takes time? How many know that it's a journey? And it's a journey we're on our entire life. And I, and I begin to look at this, these 10 words and realize that it's about the journey that God wants to take me on through my relationship with Jesus Christ. And I want to talk about those 10 words and how they make a difference in our life and how if we look at them in the right way, they can keep us fresh and start something new in each one of us. The, the first two words say this, follow me. Can you say that with me? Follow me. You know what's interesting about those two words is it really is basically about just acknowledging who Jesus is. He said, I, I want you to follow me. How many know that Jesus had a lot of followers? How many know that not every single follower of Jesus was fully engaged? Some of them were, were, you know, had a head knowledge. They were acknowledging who he was. They, they, they had this belief thing going on. And so they were kind of just walking along and following Jesus and just trying to figure out who he was. He was going against the system. And, you know, their culture probably wasn't any different than ours. We love to follow people who go against the flow. And so he said, follow me, and people started following him, and people started learning about him, and people started, you know, taking in some facts about Jesus. So I would say this. That, that follow me is the first step in our journey, and that is to engage, engage in a relationship with Jesus with our head. It means that we understand who he is. It means that we acknowledge that he has authority in our life. And, and, and follow me was a simple invitation of Jesus to follow him. At that point, he didn't throw a lot of stipulations on it. At that point, he said, you know what? We're heading this way. Why don't you come and join what we're doing? And so people would follow. How many know that some people would also leave? We'll talk about that in a minute. So he said, follow me. It's an invitation that begins our journey with Jesus. I know here at Barefoot Church on a weekly basis, Pastor Clay gets up here and he gives an opportunity for people to follow Jesus, to take that first step. But how many know it goes beyond that first step? It, you know, it, it, it's more than taking a step to follow Jesus because once you start down that path, it's a whole new life as many of us begin to learn. But it starts with simply acknowledging with our head that we believe he is who he says he is. It starts with beginning to accumulate the information that we need to be a true follower of Jesus. And so Jesus starts with this invitation to simply follow Jesus. Him. You know, when he says, follow me, that is a, a disciple. We understand that a disciple of Jesus must follow who? Anybody else? It's not a trick question. Jesus. I mean, don't tell me you're a, a, a disciple of Jesus if you don't follow Jesus. Don't tell me that you're, you're, you have a relationship with Jesus if he's not in the lead. And so a disciple of Jesus, following Jesus means that we recognize and accept that he's Lord, that he's leader, that ma he's master. He's the one who initiates, he's the one who guides, and we simply step in line and follow him. It means acknowledging that Jesus is in, is in the front and he's out in front of us. John chapter 12 and verse 26, it says, Jesus said, whoever serves me must follow me. In case you didn't get that, let me say that again. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. And so the process, the, the start of the journey that Jesus want to take, wants to take us on is, is he wants us to follow him. He wants us to begin to learn who he is. He wants us to be in, in, engaged with the head about how much we know about him because he knows this. That if we'll begin to learn who he is, who he truly is, there's a good chance we'll take the next step. Now, the next thing that he said, he said, follow me and I will what? And be remember, I will make you. I will make you. Now, this is where he starts working on our heart. How, how many know that, that we need to have our hearts worked on? Amen. He says, I'll make you. Now, when I read that verse, well, I will make you, that means that he probably has to unmake me. There, there are probably some attitudes that I have. There may be some attitudes that you have. There may be some concerns that you have. There may be some emotional instabilities that you have because maybe you have some anger issues and maybe you have some worry issues and maybe you have some fear issues. And, and, and so we come to Jesus as we are. 
And I love the fact that he takes us for who we are, sin and all. He takes us no matter how, how deep in the depths of sin we are, and he will wash us clean, and he will give us a brand new start if we'll give him our heart. So that means he needs to unmake us. That means he needs to take some things that are jacked up and messed up in our life and make them new, and we have to give him the freedom to do that. So he says, follow me. That's the head. He says, and I will make you. That's the heart, that, that's, you know, that's where we need to be unmade in order to be remade. You know, we just got past Christmas. How, how many like Christmas? I like Christmas. I, I, like, I like giving gifts, I, I'll be, but I like getting them too. I'm just going to be honest, a moment of pure honesty. Anybody like getting gifts? Yeah, look at all you self-righteous people out there. Not me, man. I, I'm all about giving. Let's just say I like to do both. And, um, you know, every time somebody gives me, like, my, my family, they, all, they, they, they know I like clothes, so they'll give me clothes. I like new clothes. Anybody like new clothes? I like the feeling of wearing fresh clothes. I don't even care what they are. It's just that they're new and they're fresh and they smell good and they're just, there's just something about wearing new clothes. But how, how goofy would it be if I took those new clothes and I didn't take off my old clothes, but I just put the new clothes on top of my old clothes. How many of you know that would just be ridiculous? Yeah. I mean, if you look around, somebody would be going, dude, you still got your old clothes on underneath the new ones? Yeah, man. You'd think I was crazy. But isn't that what we do with our life? We expect Jesus to do a new thing, but we won't take off the old. We expect Jesus to renew us and to make us fresh, but yet we won't allow him to get rid of the old stuff that can't be mixed with the new. Jesus says, listen, follow me. You know, engage, acknowledge with your head that you believe I am who I say that I am. And then he says, but he says, and then I will make you. That's a process. How many of you know it takes a long time to make some of us? He says, I will make you. Just when we think he's made us, we unmake it all. And he has to start over again and rebuild and refresh. Because that's what he does. Now here's what I've learned. That the biggest barrier in, in the life of most followers of Jesus is from the head to the heart. I would say the majority of churches are filled with people who have a head relationship with Jesus. They, they want to come to church. They want to be a part of the church. They want to be involved in worship. But man, it, as soon as it comes time to, to, to be generous or as soon as it comes time to serve or as soon as it comes time to actually follow what the Bible has to say, everything changes. As soon as a pastor, there he goes, talking about money again. <laughs> he's just telling you what the Bible says. If you do, you'll be blessed. And he's telling you that because he loves you, and he wants to see the best for your life, and he wants to see God's favor. But see, here's the deal. When we're just engaged with our head, and all of a sudden somebody deals with a heart issue from the word of God, all of a sudden everything changes. When pastor gets on stage and he says, the Bible says that any sex outside of marriage is sin, ooh, did you feel the temperature in the room just change? As soon as we start talking about the heart, as soon as we start talking about what it takes to be remade, everything changes. Why? Because there's a major hurdle between the head and the heart. And there are many of us here today that have, have some issues, some things in our life, some reasons why we've never taken the next step. There's probably people here today that have been in church for years and years and years, but have never really fully engaged into a, a fully devoted follower of Christ. And why, I would say, because there are some obstacles that have never gotten out of the way. You, you've convinced yourself that just being engaged with the head is okay. But he you wants your heart. He wants your heart. He wants you to be fully in. And so Jesus said, follow me. And he said, and I'll do what? I will make you. See, disciples of Jesus can only be changed by Jesus. 
And when Jesus gets in the life of a person, they'll never be the same. Amen? I mean, you tell me you have Jesus, and uh, I, I think we'll see the evidence of it in your life. Discipleship at heart involves transformation at the deepest level of our understanding, our affections, and our will. Let me ask you, what's the biggest obstacle? What's the biggest obstacle in your way of being a fully devoted follower of Christ? And what needs to get out of the way? And then Jesus says this, follow me and I will make you what? Fishers? Fishers, he says, of people. I'm running out of room. There we go. And this, engage, this is where we engage our hand. This is where we engage our talents. This is where we engage our abilities. This is where we begin to understand that every single thing that we have has been given to us by God. And here's what I've learned about along the way, because as a pastor, sometimes I get frustrated that people won't utilize what's in their hand. Sometimes I say to myself, why in the world will people not go help feed the hungry? I don't get it. Why, why won't people be generous? Why won't people give an hour a week to shake hands at a door? Why? I mean, I say that all the time. And here's what I've learned. It's because at some point there's a barrier. Because here's the deal. If, if you follow Jesus with your head and all of a sudden you get the right things in your head and it begins to change what's in your heart, he's going to get what's in your hand. So the only conclusion I could come to is that there are many people that go to church that Jesus still doesn't have their heart. Because when he has your heart, you'll give him what's in your hand. You'll trust him what's in your hand. You'll become a kingdom player. I wrote this in my notes. If our acceptance of Jesus begins in the head and extends to the heart, it leads to a change with what we do with our hands. It means we join Jesus on his mission. In his agenda to love and reach a lost and hurting world. It means that we understand that our mission, I don't know if you know this, our mission is not to come to church. Do you know that? Our mission's not to come to church. I believe we need to come to church. Hebrews 10.25 says that it's part of what we're supposed to do. It's a responsibility. It's where we join together and get encouraged. It's where we come together and, and we share the, the message of hope. It's where we spur one another on to good works. But our mission isn't to go to church. Our mission is to be the church. We're called to be the church. And you can't be the church if you haven't given God what's in your head, what's in your heart, and what's in your hand you got to be on mission with him. There, there are so many people that go to church in our culture and have never fully understood what it means to be the church. Now, I, I can't imagine what God would do, Matt, at Barefoot Church this year if we got, grabbed a hold of that principle, if we understood what it meant to be a fully devoted follower of Christ. You know, there are people dying and going to hell, and we have the greatest message on the planet and that is the message of hope found in Jesus. And that message is preached best, not up here, but when we're out in the community using what's in our hands. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15 says this. It says, he died for everyone. Aren't you thankful that Jesus died for everyone? Amen. He died for everyone. So that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Let me say that again. So that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they'll live for Christ, who died and was raised for them. So here's three questions that we need to answer that I want to ask you today to see if God can do something new in you. Number one, what's in your hand? Or what's in your heart? I'm, I'm wrong. I'm, I'm like dyslexic too. I'm ADD and dyslexic. Let's start over. What's in your head, right? What's in your head? You know, how many of us have some stinking thinking? You're here today, and, and the reason it, it can't go any farther is you've got some messed up stuff in your head that you've never taken care of. Maybe you're here today, and, and you keep allowing the wrong things into your head. You need to understand something. If you allow the wrong things into your head, it's going to play out through all the other steps in your life and the process of your life. 
So what's, a, what's in your head? What's going on in your head? What are you thinking? Maybe, you know, maybe the enemy's got you convinced that, that you need a new marriage, that the grass is greener on the other side. You do know you still have to mow the grass on the other side, right? And so, and so you, you begin, I believe there might be someone here today that's already thinking that process. The enemy's already been at work and the enemy's already got a little, and you know, once you take that first step and once that first wrong thought gets in your head, how many know that he just builds on it? And you're going to get down the wrong path on the wrong journey in a direction God never intended you to go because of what's in your head. So ask yourself today, what's in your head? Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 says this. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Listen, real change, real transformation starts with what's in your head. Number two, let me ask this question, what's in your heart? What's in your heart? Here, here's what's interesting. The only way for something to get in your heart it has to first start in your head. So how important is it what you're putting in your head? It's majorly important because it's going to determine what basically gets into your heart. It's going to determine what gets rooted there and what gets planted there and the seeds that are there and what grows up and what gets harvested in your life. It says in, in Luke chapter 6 and verse 45, a good man brings good things out of, out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart's full of. So what's ever in here is what's going to come out. And so whatever you put in here gets down here, and that's going to come out. It's going to eventually work its way out in either what you say or what you do, because you are what's in your heart. So what's in your heart? And number three, What's in your hand? What's in your hand? Way back in Exodus, God showed up to Moses, 80 years old. It's been in the wilderness for 40 years because of a poor decision in his life, but I believe he's exactly where God wanted him. But he spent 40 years in the wilderness. 40 years, God put him in a position to get ready to use him and and finally, God shows up, and Moses doesn't even understand what he's been prepared for. And so God begins to tell him that he wants him to go free the children of Israel from the bondage of Egypt. And Moses doesn't think he has what it takes. And so Moses begins to question God. How many know that's a bad idea? If God's coming to you and God's saying he's going to do something, you should understand he's already got it figured out. So he comes to Moses, and, you know, Moses really had five questions that I think we all have. Five questions. Number one, his first question really at the, at the core was this, am I going to be alone? Nobody wants to do anything alone. The second one was, am I worthy? The third question was, am I believable? The fourth question was, am I capable? And the fifth question really was, am I even available? But God asked him a question in all that process of change. He said, Moses, what's in your hand? What Moses had in his hand was a staff. And that staff was a picture of his identity the last 40 years. He was, a, he was a shepherd in the wilderness, and that staff represented who he was. And Moses said, it's a staff. And God said, throw it down. And when he threw it down, it turned into a snake. Now, why would God do that? Because God wanted to show him his power. And so he threw it down, it became a snake, and he said, now pick it up by the tail. I mean, that sounds crazy. I don't know a lot, but I know you probably shouldn't pick a snake up by the tail, because that leaves his mouth available. But he picked it up, and it turned back into a staff, and just a few short verses later, God said this, now when you go to Egypt, take with you the staff of God. See, maybe the reason some things aren't working for you right now is because you've never let go of them. Because you're hanging on to them. And God's saying to you today, I just want you to throw it down. I'll do what I need to do with it. And I'll tell you when to pick it back up. 
And when you pick it back up, it will be the staff of God. So what's in your hand? What's in your hand? What talents and abilities do you have that can be used for the kingdom of God? Ephesians 2.10 says, We're God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. See, we're all ministers of Christ, and we have God-given abilities that can be used to glorify God. You know what's cool, too? Is our life experience is a part of that plan. There, there are some of you here today that can reach people I could never come close to. You, you have a story I don't have. There, there may be some of you here today that have been so far down in the depths, you can go down there where somebody is right now and you can tell them their, your story and give them hope in a way nobody else can because your story is unique. God's given you your story. God's given you experience. God's given you your talents. God's given you your treasure to use for his kingdom. And I want to encourage you to do something new in 2014 to allow God to remake you. You know, God, he wants to do a few things. God, God, God wants, to, he wants to renew what's in your head so he can reshape what's in your heart so that he can repurpose what's in your hand. Amen? He wants to repurpose what's in your hand so that you can be someone who helps him change the world. Would you stand with me and read this prayer on the side screens? Let's read it together. You don't have to repeat after me. We'll just read it together. Ready? Lord, I'm asking you to do something new in me today. If my heart is hard, loosen it up. If my spirit is critical, forgive me and give me a fresh outlook. If my hopes have been dashed, renew a fire in me. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you bow your heads with me? You know, the most important way that you can start fresh in 2014 is to begin a relationship with your creator through his son, Jesus Christ. You might ask, why do I need that relationship? Because we're told in the word of God that we've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And there's a, there's a price to be paid for that sin. God's a holy God and we're not. If we ever want to get when this life is over into the presence of God, it means something had to happen. And what had to happen is that God had to send his son Jesus to die on a cross, to pay a price for my sin and your sin, that we would trust in him. We could have eternal life. Maybe today that fresh start for you needs to simply just be taking the first step in following Jesus. If that's you, would you pray this? Would you say, God, I know that I sin, and I know that my sin separates me from you because you're a holy God. And God, right here in this place right now, I ask you to forgive me. And God, I want to embrace you, embrace your son, Jesus. God, I trust that he did what he did on the cross for me, that he died, that he was buried, that he rose again to give me a fresh start, to do a new thing in me. And so God, today, I give my life to you. I make you my master, my Lord, and my Savior. In Jesus' name. Heads bowed and eyes closed. I would love to pray for you today. If you prayed that, to, that prayer today to trust in Jesus. All over this place, you just say, Pastor Tim, I prayed that prayer today with an uplifted hand to trust in Jesus. Anybody like that? Say, I prayed that prayer to trust in Jesus. Thank you. Awesome. Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you, God, that you are God who does new things. God, I know there are probably many people here today that may have struggled in 2013, and maybe even this, this last week, and come here today a little bit overwhelmed, but I, I I, I beg you, God, to refresh them, to open their eyes, God, to, to let them know that even in spite of those circumstances, even in, in spite of some of the things in the past, that, God, you can use those things for your honor and for your glory. And so, God, encourage us today. Give us hope. God, renew us. And, God, get us prepared for an incredible year for you. God, I thank you for those, God, who trusted to follow in you today. We thank you for that step that they've taken. God, I thank you for Barefoot Church and what it's doing here in Myrtle Beach. I thank you for the relationship that you've allowed me to have um, with their pastor, Clay, and I just pray that God, as he's away, that he'll get refreshed and be able to come back with incredible power to continue to lead this church. And God, we thank you for all that you do. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said...